guys. I'm Pastor Steve, so glad that you could spend part of your weekend with us, so welcome in. If you are a first-time guest, I want to encourage you, um, check in with us in the, in the lobby, and we get a little free City Hope mug, so, uh, you know, it's worth it. We're bribing you to get your information and to sell it online. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we wouldn't do that very much um, anymore. Pending lawsuits. I kid. Um, so, I want to, man, I want to jump in and just say thank you to our band for doing such a great job today. Can we just give it up? Man. Um, I, every week for three years, when I walk in here, I'm encouraged, and so I think that's a huge deal. And I want to give a special thanks from behind the scenes. Um, PR Frank and Lori helped write this. Uh, it's a longer song, No Strings, that Allie was able to sing part of that there. Uh, man, and it just goes right from the scripture, right from our sermon series. So thank you guys for helping bless our church by with your creative talent. Um, right now, as we welcome everybody, you might want to grab a Bible as we jump into the Word of God. And I want to let you know, um, we're not traditionally passing any uh, buckets right now during this time, but we do have offering boxes in the back, and you can give online. If you're a first-time guest, offering's not for you, but it is um, for everybody else. So we just part of us giving back from a grateful heart. So we give our time, our talents, and our treasure to God as we worship Him. So diving into uh, Luke chapter 6, this is where we've been studying a series called No Strings. And if this is your first Sunday tracking with us on this series, I just want to tell you we're, we're trying to unearth what Jesus talked about in His definition of love. Not our definition of love, not just um, the world's definition of love, or not even a feeling, but really unearthing. And, and He said these three words that really turn everything we prior think about love on its head. And he said, love your enemies. I, I don't know, maybe I'm just a dramatic person or a preacher that exaggerates things. I don't know. But to me, those three words are earth shattering. Love your enemies. As soon as I saw that Jesus wrote that, I understand something about love that I learned nowhere else. And that is that love is more than a feeling Love is, is more than just, it's, it's, there's something hard to it, sacrificial to it. So God-type love is this agape love that, that where you love unexpectedly, no strings. And, you know, we do, we have strings. I got some up here. This is rope, but it's a type of big string. Um, and, and we're going to be talking about this throughout the, the series this morning, and, and uh, you know, I was thinking about this. Have you ever been on the, uh, maybe a phone call or just in a personal conversation and you just have someone kind of walking on you? Maybe they're pushing your buttons. And you just, it's taking all of your self-control not to like rip their head off. You know what I'm saying? Like you want to, I'm the only person? Because I know I've failed at this before. Um, and, you, you know, you, have you ever been in that situation and you're just like, you're trying to explain something and there's really nothing you can say to make the situation better. It's just getting worse and worse and you're just butting heads. This is just something that happens. So whether it's with, whether it's with our words, it, it, we've been, you know, with the, what's said or with our actions, we're on planet Earth with all these other inconvenient beings and they're humans and they're just... Blah, why do we, don't even, all you introverts are like, yeah, amen, I don't like human beings. Um, all the extroverts are like, let me at them, I love them, I want to be near you and get your germs. Um, but that's taken on a whole new meaning, hasn't it? Um, so there's been times in my life, you know, where, you know, I think of the times where I'm on the phone and somebody's misunderstanding. Misunderstandings are one of the hardest things for me. Because it's like deep down as a people pleaser, there's just this thing where I want you to understand that I love you. And so if you question that, then I'm just, I give up. Like if you don't know that I love you and I love you more than like your mom does, then this is just, what this is all in vain because I just screwed up so big. But um, anyway, so there's misunderstandings I've had. And there's times where even a person like me who's generally empathetic like, there's times where I want to rip somebody's head off. 
um, you know, and whether it be in traffic or a weird phone call or those people actually that call you all the time and they have no business calling you, where they get your number. I'm actually mad about that. But anyway, um, if you like, if you go in the, my blocked calls list on my phone, you can just scroll, just blocking all these people. Block, you're blocked. It might be some of y'all. I don't even know. No, I wouldn't. Well, I would if you bothered me too much, but. I'm just playing. I play. I'm just kidding. Y'all just seem y'all awake. You know what I'm saying? Um, all right. So here's the thing, though. So I, I've revealed that, you know, I'm not always great at that. But here's the thing. We all kind of have this tendency. We all think in a math equation. We think, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. That's just the way we naturally think. That's the way the world works. Eye for eye. Tooth for tooth. This is a math equation. One for one. And Jesus, with his words, just goes, whoop, I'm just going to flip the whole scenario on you. This is why they call Jesus an amazing teacher, master teacher, probably the best teacher who's ever lived. Praise God, he's more than just an amazing teacher. He's our Savior, died and on the cross for sins as a substitute for our sins and resurrected from the dead. But we can't discredit the fact that he was an amazing teacher. So what does he say? Luke 6, verse 28. Luke 6, verse 28, bless those who curse you. We talked about that last week. And here's the part, pray for those who abuse you. Look, we all want to, we, look, we, if we wrote the Bible, if this was just a human book and there was no God equation, God doesn't exist, this is just a bunch of human authors, this wouldn't be in the Bible, I'm telling you right now. If, if, if someone like me wrote the Bible and we would write it, we, would, we would transcribe it, abuse those who abuse you. That's what a human would write. It took something divine to speak into human history, to reveal to us something that's counterintuitive to our nature, something that is harder than we want to do ourselves. Pray? See, okay, so far, you know, it, it, you've got, we've all kind of got off the hook pretty easy. It's like, okay, I love you, man, even if you're my enemy. I love you, man, even if you don't vote the way I vote. Or, or you know, I can bless you even if you curse me. Hey, have a good day, but then I don't have to deal with you anymore. But this is a whole other game changer to say, pray for the people who hurt you. Why, Jesus, are you sure that you want me to get all spiritual about this person who hurt me? You know, and I ask the question, does, is Jesus serious? <laughs> because the reality is, is we all, if we're honest, we would hurt those who hurt us. And Jesus says, pray for them. Both can't be right. You know, this is what I would want to do. And this is what Jesus says I'm supposed to do. There's no compromise really in the middle. It's no, it's, there's no like, kind of, kind of pray for him. You know, it's just, you, it's like, this is where you see that the teachings of Jesus lead us to like this all in type thing. And the measurement of a believer is much more than some of the things that we naturally think they are. The measurement of someone who identifies and says, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. He saved my ever-loving soul. It's not just, do you go to church? That's a great thing to do. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. The Bible, that's a command. But beyond, we measure it with that, and that's external. It's not even the way you dress. It's not even the name on the building or what time you meet. It's not the external sometimes that we're always naturally thinking about. It's this is the hard stuff. This is, you know when Jesus said, take up your cross. If anyone will follow me, he better be ready to deny himself. This is what Jesus was talking about. Because you cannot pray for someone who hurt you truly if they hurt you. We're talking emotionally, spiritually, mentally. They're just a strain to you. How do you pray for that person? This is a question. As soon as Jesus says it, we're all asking, how do you pray for them? I don't know the answer aside from looking to Jesus. He's leading us 
to the reality of that this is something bigger than you. You see, this, the impossibility of praying for people who wrong you points us to the importance of his mission. That's the thing about Jesus. He just was always consistent in who he was. He was always, beyond a shadow of a doubt, from the time he was born in a manger until the time that he was dead, buried, rose again, and then 40 days showing himself to his disciples, up to 500 people he showed himself to him, resurrected. All of that time that he walked and talked on planet Earth, he was consistent. He always cared about people who were non-believers. Always. In the very beginning of his ministry, this was his disciples. They were unbelievers. He says, come follow me, but they were thinking that Jesus was about to start a revolution and take swords and overthrow the Roman Empire. They didn't get it. And then when Jesus is crucified, they all fled except for a few women and John that were at the foot of the cross. Doubt, 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 doubt. Skeptics, cynics. Over and over and over again, you see the life of Jesus, and you see it, you've seen it portrayed in movies, and you can read it in the pages of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and you can see that Jesus was this person, here's the road I'm supposed to go on to get from A to B, and Jesus just finds this squirrely way over here, oh, you know what, I'm going to go in Samaria for a few minutes, and i got to talk to this woman at a well, and all the disciples are like, I don't, he must not have got the memo, we have to be over here at 2 o'clock. And they all try to tell him, no, we ain't going to Samaria. Jesus, dude, we got to be. Remember, you're talking to the big crowd of people. They're important. You know, you're going to talk to some Israelites. We want Israel to be saved. And Jesus is like, hold on, I got some business. There's a woman at a well at noon, and he shows up there. And, and the fact she's there at noon, this isn't even my sermon notes, this is just free. The fact that she's there at noon means she was a total outcast from society because all the women go to get their water from the well at the morning before it got too hot. She's there at noon scorching her brains out to get water because no one wanted anything to do with her. But praise God, Jesus did. He found her. There's Matthew, the tax collector. Everybody hates taxes, and you should. They're, like, messed up. Back then, it was even worse. Of course, under tyranny, you hate taxes. Matthew wasn't a Jewish person who's an agent of Rome. He's compromised his own faith so that he can corruptly take money from people. Jesus shows up to him, to Matthew. And all the other disciples are like, we don't want anything to do with that kind of person. And Jesus showed up to him and says, here's you. Here's me. Let's be best friends. Come follow me. Every account I read of Jesus, I go, wow. He loved people like me all the time. Then there's Jesus on the cross. And even as they cursed him, put nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns. Oh, you say you're a king? We got your crown, buddy. They took the crown of thorns. They mashed it into his skull. As the blood trickled down his face. And there on the cross, he prayed for those who hurt him. (laughs) Wow. You know, it's so refreshing. Think about this. To hear from somebody who practiced what they preached. You know, I can't even practice this perfectly. I'm going to screw this up. Because you curse me, I might curse you back. (laughs) You know, I work construction part-time. I I, I might curse you back. I'm not that self-controlled. But Jesus lived it, man. Wow. On the cross. What worse hurt could there be than Roman crucifixion? Is there any in the history of mankind? Is there any worse abuse that there could be? And he prayed for the, his, his abusers and said, Father, forgive them. Is there anything that you and me on planet Earth can experience that's worse than Roman crucifixion? And he prayed for those who hurt him. 
So when he asks us that if, if you say you're a believer, that's not just, oh, I go to church and, oh, I, I have that little thing on my Facebook that says Christian, you know, or I shared a lot of Christian memes. They're so funny. He, he's leading you to something way more significant, imitating him. He prayed for those who abused him. No wonder he asked us to do it. Because it's earth shattering. It, it, it's world changing. It's revolutionary. I think if we follow the teachings of Jesus, we, we were just going to have an amazing impact in the world. And it's not always the way we think. A lot of times it's because we break down walls with love. We just, somebody spits in your face and, and you just, you show them the love of Jesus. That's, I'm not always going to get that right, but I'll just say, isn't that what you want? Like, are you with me? Like, when you read Jesus saying, pray for those who abuse you, isn't there something in here that goes, I want to be like that? I mean, if you're honest, because there's another part of us, too, that feels really good when we tear somebody down. They hurt me. I want to hurt them back. And it just, that feels so good. In a different way. But there's something as part of our design. There's something as part of our calling. There's something in the Holy Spirit and from the word of God and the teachings of Jesus that is leading us. Sometimes God speaks through the small, still voice. And it's in that moment when you're on the phone and you're ready to tear them down that the Holy Spirit just comes into your life and says, This is a soul that you're talking to. This is a human being. I know they've hurt you. I know they're annoying you. I, I, I know that they've pushed all your buttons, but they need me too. So he says, pray for those who abuse you. And I want to just break this down into two sections and we talk about it. First, prayer. Pray for those who abuse you. Prayer. And those who abuse you, what do we do? How do you, so Two sections. First off, what is prayer? And I just want to go through this quickly because I think this establishes what's Jesus. We don't want to be ambiguous. What's he asking us to do? What is prayer? Authentic prayer is the trademark of authentic believers. Martin Luther said this. It is the, as it is the business of tailors to make clothes, cobblers to make shoes. I thought cobbler was a food. Cobblers to make shoes. This is the 1500s, so I guess... There you go. So it is the business of Christians to pray. It's the business of tailors to make clothes. It's the business of cobblers to make shoes. It's the business of Christians to pray. It's a trademark. It's a trademark of faith. Praying to the unseen God. If you read Matthew chapter 6, you, you quickly realize in Jesus gives these instructions about prayer. You know, he preached this sermon more than once. And in, in Matthew 6, he, he relays this message and he says, Look, don't be like the hypocrites who when they're praying, they like to say these big phrases and sound really pretty to impress everybody. He says, go and pray in secret that the Father sees and knows. You know, I've thought about that really a lot. And I just want to say, so we're in the context of talking about those who have abused you. If you're hurting and you're broken, be honest. Are you honest with God? Did you know that God requires that? You're like, well, I don't like God. Well, have you told him? You know, I'm kind of mad at God about this thing that happened at my other church, and I'm, I'm mad about the pastor or the priest or this thing, and I'm, I'm mad about, have you told him? You know, you wouldn't believe what my ex-husband did to me. You wouldn't believe it. Have you told God? You see, there's no such thing as pretending with God. We can pretend, but it doesn't exist. It's like a thing that doesn't, you, it's a cancels itself out. You, you cannot pretend with God. It, you can pretend, but you're living in an illusion. He is not mistaken at all, ever. He, he sees the intentions of your heart at all times. It's 
tricky. It's kind of crazy, right? So he knows you're mad already. Why not tell him? He knows you're hurt already. Why not tell him? I think that's a really good starting point. That's prayer. A lot of times we think of prayer as praying for our situation or, or praying you know, for, for, for a provision. And, and there's so many different types of prayers. But, but I just want us to kind of get this basic, generic thing and realize that prayer is, it's from, it has to be authentic. It is personal. Number two, prayer is your heart to his heart, his heart to your heart. Here's what I mean. You're out there and you're, you're, you're somewhere you're saying, I want to know God. And then also, on the other end of it, you might be saying, I want God to know me. This is a reciprocal relationship, and prayer is the important part of that. So here's a couple verses about that. Number one is, you're saying, I want to know God? Well, there's prayers in the Bible about that. David said this, as the deer pants for the flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. His prayer to God was saying, I, I am desperate to know you. You know, there used to be a, a popular Christian, maybe it was the 90s or early 200s. I want to know you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. Is that the prayer of your heart? Because there's so many other things. But prayer to know God can put everything else in perspective. And I want God to know me. There's prayers about that in the Bible. Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. What a scary prayer. But that is utter honesty. That's I'm open to you, God. I'm not hiding anything. I'm fooling myself to hide it anyway. Search me and know me. Have you ever prayed that prayer to God? Have you ever said, God, here I am. I want you to know the intents of my heart. I want you to examine my life. I, you have full access. And it's a scary thing. And I'm so grateful for your grace. But come on in and search it. Is there anything here in how I've been acting? You know, I, I'm not really loving my enemies. That's hard. Help me make that adjustment. I, I'm not really doing good to those people who, who have messed with me. I, I'm not really praying for those people who have abused me. Can you come into the situation? Can you? I'm showing you I want you in my life. So then here's the question. We're talking about people who hurt you. If you're hurt, is it not a better situation for your health to be close to your creator. Do you want to go in to a situation dealing with a conflict or dealing with hurt and dealing with baggage? Do you want to deal with that solo or do you want to deal with that with God? Out of closeness with him. Out of communion with him. Out of I have a close relationship with God. I'm not a perfect person. I sin every single day. Uh, there's even the people who pretend to be perfect people. We soon find out that they get knocked off their pedestal. But listen, so none of us are perfect. But we can all be close with him. That's the beautiful part of scripture. It's not the stories of people who were perfect. It's the story of one person, Jesus, who was perfect, and he died on the cross for our sins. But it's the stories of how God interacts with people who aren't perfect. That he's still close with Abraham, even though Abraham blew it multiple times. He's still close with, with Moses, even though Moses killed somebody. Goodness sakes. He still interacts with Samson and answers his deathbed prayer. Even though Samson was a womanizer and screwed things up, up and down the list. Why? Because God deals with us because of his faithfulness, not because of ours. That's what grace is. All right, number three. Prayer has the power to change the situation and this is critical when we're talking about, talking about being hurt. He has the power to change the situation, and he has the power to change you through prayer. So, we mentioned Moses a minute ago. For some reason, God chose to speak to Moses. 
probably for the nation of Israel, for their sake, to hear a message from God. Moses goes up onto the mountain to commune with God and to have no one had ever seen God. But God speaks to Moses on the mountain, reveals to him, and writes into stone Ten Commandments. By the way, there was uh, 613 of them. There's just ten that were the most famous. And he writes them onto tablets of stone. God himself wrote this. This isn't something Moses made up. We call it the law of Moses, but it's not something that came from Moses. This is God's law. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt honor the Sabbath. These came directly from God. He wrote it into stone. What an amazing moment. You would think this is the touchdown Super Bowl moment of spirituality. And Moses... It's on the mountain with God, and while he is getting the irony, while he's getting the law of God on the mountain, down below what's going on, Aaron, who's supposed to be his right-hand man, he organizes everybody up, and he says, we are sick and tired of waiting out here in the wilderness for God to speak to us, and for us, we can't even see this God. So let's make ourselves a God that we can touch and see. Let's make ourselves a graven image. So he gets all the earrings and all the the metals and precious gold that they could find in all the camp of Israel. Millions of people. He gathers it all together. They melt it down. This took some time and some hard work. And they fashion a golden calf. And they said, here is our God. Let's bow down and worship something made that's an idol. We made it. Think of how silly it is to worship something you've created. And God saw it. There's nothing that escapes his attention. And God said in Exodus 32, I'm going to destroy Israel. The very people that I just brought out of slavery in Egypt. In other words... I tried, but they've literally cursed my name and are worshiping a precious metal I invented. But Moses prayed to God. And Moses said, I know you are God of mercy. Will you have mercy on your people, Israel? And there's two words, and theologians debate over the meaning of this, and we're not even going to get into it, but I'm just going to share it with you. God relented. You know, I've met people who said, I don't believe prayer works. Maybe you feel that way. You're not sure, does this really do anything? I can tell you, prayer works. We don't always get what we want. Because when we pray, we always say, well, it's your will, not mine. But Moses pleaded with God for the mercy of Israel. And God changed his plans. So somewhere in God's complete sovereignty over the universe, he has worked into the mathematical equation. Prayer. I will let you be able to have faith. And I will let you be able to pray. And I will allow it in my sovereign plan. I will let prayer have a purpose and make a difference. Prayer changes things. James 5 verse 13, and I'll move quickly. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let him pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs and praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church and pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith, key words, believing, will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Now listen to this part. This is, this is what intrigues me about our conversation about praying for those who abuse us. If, James chapter 5, 15. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. 
Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. This is the word of God. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Do you think Jesus would ask you to do something that was pointless? There's nothing he did in the span of his lifetime that was pointless. Do you think he would ask you to do something that was pointless? But he says, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. This intrigues me. You see, maybe us praying for those who have hurt us has a lot to do with God working in their life in ways we could never imagine on our own. So lastly, about prayer, as we move quick, in prayer, we submit our ways to God's plan. It, and we won't turn there, but Matthew 6, it says, when it talks about the Lord's Prayer, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done. So now, keeping that in mind, we've talked about what prayer is. Now, what am I really supposed to do when someone hurts me, abuses me? Because this is what Jesus has asked us to do. Pray for those who abuse you. Pray for them. Are you serious, Jesus? You know, we've talked about how hard this is. We've talked about how impossible this is. And I would just say the proof that, like, the fact that this is difficult and and honestly impossible is just proof that we need God in our life. If you're a believer, you, you need him continually. You need his strength. He's leading you to do things you can't do on your own. So... I got a little bit of an illustration. I'm going to invite uh, my friend Shaiju up here. We've, Shaiju's on staff here, man. He runs all of our video and so much more, and um, we've become really good friends. So I'm going to ask. He's going to grab a mic. You're going to grab a mic. All right. So I have an illustration, and uh, this is about strings that we have. Things break it. That's what I do. Um. I actually, I don't know how this illustration is going to work out, and I thought it would work better if it's not super scripted, so this might be interesting. So I'm going to ask Shai to insult me and hurt me, which is something that comes really naturally for him. As a disclaimer, this is pastor approved, so go ahead. Be gentle. (laughs) Might be kids watching online. Keep it PG or G. Or just just let's not do it. I don't know if I can take any... (laughs) <laughs> okay, so every time you insult me, I want you to put some, some strings on me, bro. So just go for it. Bring it on. I can take the heat. Maybe. Probably not. Your, your beard looks like it's from the early 200s. <laughs> yeah. All right. Those of you that caught that reference. Cool. Thanks, man. I know Allie has good taste, but do you have to steal all her boots and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> all right. He's like one inch from a mama joke. I feel it. It's not scripted for him, but I've been waiting for this for a long time. Thanks, man. You got any more? Uh, Now I got to think of this. He's getting creative. Your mama, so. I won't retaliate. (laughs) He will. He's lying. Later. You kind of look like the guy that would wear white after Labor Day. I'm just going to put that out there. (laughs) <laughs> that was like, that was too kind. I had to start out strong. You could be a little meaner. He's pastor after all. I can't. I get there's certain lines I can't cross. You, all right. Now that I'm right here, you, you need to kind of shower some more, man. I, I can smell <laughs> it on you. That's what I use all that air freshener before church for. All right. I've run out of rope. What if I actually dressed like this? This is like, <laughs> wow, dude. This is like 40 pounds or something, 50 pounds of... It's a good look. It feels really heavy. I feel like a pirate getting ready to anchor the boat. <laughs> All right. So this is, this is what we do when people hurt us and we hold on to it. We hold on to it. They don't. Do you see any weight on him? When we pray for them, what we are doing spiritually is we are doing this. Letting it go. Man, give it up for Shy. 
you, you ugly, you ugly. You ain't got no alibi, you, okay, I'm just, thanks, man. Here's the things, so when, when here's, the, here's the cycle on earth as we wrap this up. Hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people. We have the ability to break that cycle. Jesus, the inventor of humans, has given us that path. Cool. So here's a few things of how to break the cycle. Number one, praying for those who have hurt you is a healing path. Jesus did it. We should do it. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Most times when we pray, God can unlock our heart, lead us to understanding, and lead us to forgiveness. Number two, praying for those who have hurt us helps us see more clearly. Not only is it the healing path, I would argue from Scripture right here, look at verse 39. If you have a Bible or on the app, Luke 6, 39 through 42. This helps us see more clearly. He told them in a parable, Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye. I'm here. God appointed me on planet Earth to be a person who helps you morally. I just, I'm here on Earth to point out all the things you've done wrong. And, and I don't even, you don't even see the log in your own eye. And when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye, you, listen, this is the words of Jesus, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see, listen to these words, see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Praying for those who hurt you helps you to see more clearly. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go through life only seeing half of the equation, only seeing my own frustrations, my own hurt. It's like wearing glasses where I only see the world through my hurt. I only see the world through my brokenness. I only see the world as I'm a victim. But we have the ability to, in prayer, to reclaim a life that is just transformed. Lastly, he says, praying for those who've hurt you, invites God into their lives. Did you remember that verse from James? Saying, praying helps them come to forgiveness. See, we hold on to it. We're, we're holding on. I can't believe they did that. And, and there's some, listen, if you're truly hurt and you're truly abused, my first advice is see counseling. Get, get out of that hurtful relationship. I, I, I totally agree with that. You, you need to remove yourself from the abusive situation. God doesn't want you to be a floor mat to other people around you. You need to talk to a professional counselor. But when it comes to the spiritual side of this, prayer can take the ropes, take the strings off of you. So will you do it? Will you take time to pray for those who have hurt you? Will you pray through your hurt? Because sometimes you just need to tell God about it. We pray through the person who hurts you. And I'm not talking about those imprecatory prayers, and those are in the Bible. God, I pray you just curse them in Jesus' name. No, 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 no. Would you invite God to work in their life? People you know, they've walked all over you. Maybe someone you don't know. Would you invite God to work in their life? He knows. Hurt people hurt people. Someone hurt them, and they are hurting you. You can break the cycle. You can break the cycle. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? God, Father, we thank you so much for your word. Your word is truth. We thank you, God, that you are working in ways unseen all the time. That that there is so much good around us. We thank you that you 
are working in the world. You are bringing people who are far from you, close to you. you. You've not forgotten those who've been hurt by church. You've not forgotten those who are skeptics and cynics. You've not forgotten the atheists. You've not forgotten the unbelievers. You've not forgotten those who follow other religions. You love all people. You want a relationship with them. I pray that those who have believed in you, we would follow your ways. You have invited us to pray for those who hurt us, no matter who they are. We need your strength to do that, God. We're inviting you to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, if you're here, maybe you're the first time or the tenth time, doesn't matter, and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, listen, I'll invite you. Not only was he a great teacher, but he's our Savior. He died for all of your sins. He wants a relationship with you. You can start a relationship by saying, Jesus, would you save me? Would you come into my life? And it's not the words you pray that saves your soul, but believing in your heart. See, God sees your heart. Will you believe in him? Would you trust in him? Would you depend on him to save your soul? That can start today. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Anybody, the ground's level at the foot of the cross. You say, well, I'm not much of a church person. I, I, I'm not a very good person. I'm not very religious. That's okay. Neither am I. Jesus wasn't very religious either, but he wants a relationship with you. He's all about relationships. Will you believe in him? Invite him into your life. Start that today. And if you make that decision, you pray that prayer. I'm going to encourage you. Let us know. We can walk with you. What's the next steps? Where do you go from here? We want to help you with that. And for all of us, I just want to invite us all. Can you imagine a world? Seriously, can you imagine what the world would be like if Christians started praying for people who hurt them? Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm going to try to carry this thing. I guess we'll leave the ropes here. But let's stand. Let's sing. Let's tell Jesus how great he is. Jesus, there's no
Well, today we just get to celebrate that, God's goodness and how wonderful he is. We're about to have a baptism. So City Hope, if there's ever been a time that you've been encouraged, that you've hollered out, as Steve might say, and yelled and been excited for somebody, this is our moment. So are we ready? Yeah, if you can hear me, I just broke my microphone. <laughs> test, test. You guys got me? Yes. Probably have to turn it way up. They tape this thing to the back of me. All right, you may see it. All right, guys, this is Phoenix right here. I'm going to lift him up. <laughs> and uh, Phoenix, through uh, spending time with his mommy and daddy, and talking about Jesus has come to faith. Man, we tried so hard on this mic thing and it messed up. Um, and he he recently has made a profession of faith, talked with mommy and daddy, had some questions, and and they led him to trust in Jesus. So, all right, come right here, buddy. Hold my hand right here. I won't let you drown. All right. Put this hand right here. All right. Now, Phoenix. Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? All right, buddy. I now, and it's my joy to do it, baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, you hear him cheering? All y'all... You know what, we prayed back here, but I want to invite you, anybody who ever gets baptized, let's pray for them, and let's pray for their walk with Jesus. So I invite you all to pray for Phoenix as a, a new brother in Christ. So, all right, let's give it up one more time. I'm going to turn it over to James for some closing announcements. Thanks, James. Always a win. Always a win. I remember when that happened for me uh, as a child. Um, so let's celebrate that. You know what was also a win today when I walked in today? And I saw coffee there. Marsha, thank you. <laughs> it's been like six months without coffee at church. And that's it's not as big a win as that, but that was a win. So, hey, I got some announcements here. Um, this Tuesday, the 13th, we're giving out food again from 6 to 7.30. And you've if you haven't come and taken advantage of that, Yeah? Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, for anybody not just in need that you know, but if you feel like somebody would be blessed by that. I took 15 boxes last time, and uh, friends that were surprised. <laughs> I'll just read the script. Um, <laughs> no, no <laughs> literally. I, somebody took, it's neatly packed in boxes. It's not like you have to take this food and carry grocery bags. It's neatly packed in boxes and it's good stuff. Um, a friend of mine took out potatoes and looked at her husband and almost started crying. He's like, she's pregnant, was told to stay home, and he just had surgery on his foot. And there was tension in the house that day about going back to the store to get potatoes. And she put out, and she started crying. <laughs> So it's just not about people in need. We're all in need, to tell you the truth. But if you feel like you could bless somebody, come get it. It's, it's, it's an amazing blessing that we get to do that and give hope through those little things, through, through the food. So 6.30, 6 to 7.30 on Tuesday. Next Sunday, the 18th, we're kicking off a new Bible study uh, based on this book called How's Your Soul from Judah Smith. Uh, Pastor Steve will be leading that. It's 5 p.m. here at the church. Sign up on the church website under events. It's a great opportunity to grow. Um, and the last announcement is we're going to have a family field day on Saturday, October 24th, 5 p.m. Right down here. Most of you may not know, some of you do, but behind this building here, the school building, there's a beautiful field and there's also a baseball Field there, So uh, our athletic director slash senior pastor Steve has decided <laughs> to, uh, um, to pull together on October 24th, 5 p.m., food, bonfire, tailgating, family fun, 
And also, this is a big announcement, our first annual kickball tournament. Um, hey, listen, you know, this week I spoke to an 11-year-old. <laughs> this, wait, 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 that's not, I'm not ready for that yet. Not ready for that. But this week I spoke to an 11-year-old. We were training basketball, high-level stuff, and she came up and I said, hey, do you play a sport? And she said, yes, I do. And I said, what do you play? Wiffle ball. And she said it like that was a thing. And I'm like, yeah, wiffle ball. So don't underestimate kickball, October 24th. And this is serious, OK? We've got sign up for teams next Sunday. And here are the team names. The Purple Wombats. The Blue are there kids here? The blue naked mole rats. The green sloths. And the pink chihuahuas. Just so you know, Senior Pastor Steve, Athletic Director Steve, and the guy taking you through this are all three different people. All right? Just, so please come for this class and come back next Sunday to hear the preaching because the guy that picked all those names is, is completely a different person. Um, you won't want to miss this day. Bring your long chair, bring your cooler. Uh, Steve, was that right? There'll be hot dogs? Yeah, so bring your drinks and chips and other things. So this is a really nice field down the hill right here, and that's where we'll be. So there you go, all the announcements, all right? You guys go on and have a good week, okay? Thank you. Jesus is nothing.